Hello and welcome to the final part of Lecture 5 on this course on Chemical Process Design. In this part of Lecture 5 we will examine how to develop a vessel layout for a distillation column and we'll discuss how to make the choice between a column that uses trays and a column that uses packing. For each type of column internal we'll introduce some rules of thumb for how much space to leave between each of the different column components and also how much liquid should be stored within the column sump. We're not going to reiterate in detail the points about pressure vessel the design that were made in Lecture 4, but they are equally as applicable here as they were for reactor design. So, a recap of key points from Lecture 4, Part 4 of this course, because they still apply to what we're doing now. So, when you're developing a vessel layout, for goodness sake, don't forget the following. Connections to the process. Connections for instrumentation and control. The specification of vents of drains and of nitrogen connections, connections for pressure relief devices, and the provision of internal access. This is general to any pressure vessel. Reactors, flash drums, three-phase separators, reflux drums, distillation columns. However, when we think about distillation columns in particular, there are some extra points that apply. Now, we need to make a decision about what the column internals are. How are we performing that vapour liquid contact? Is it going to be with certain designs of tray? Or is it going to be with num one of a number of different designs of packing? If we're using packing, then we need to think about how we alter our column layout to allow the bits of equipment that packing needs to operate effectively, specifically distributors and collectors for liquid phase. Regardless of the column internal, we need to allow vapour disengagement space for the feed. We also need to allow multiple access points along the column height, and I'll give you some rule of thumbs to how often these should be spaced. The key thing to not forget is that columns will require inspection during shutdown, much as any vessel will. But if you are the person that is inspecting the column, and you need to access the tray that's blown its valves out three stages below the condenser, and the only access point you've got are two stages above the reboiler, and there's 50 stages in the column, do you really want to climb up through the entire distillation column to get to that damaged tray? Or would you rather wish that the designer had thought ahead and put access points more frequently? We're also going to talk about the column sump and we're going to see how much liquid we should leave in there for control purposes. So let's think about what goes inside a distillation column. Up till this point we haven't really talked about that. You've done your simulation studies and you've always been doing these simulation studies in theoretical stages. A theoretical stage is just an ideal device in which vapour liquid equilibrium can occur and it doesn't say anything about what that device is. Now we need to translate those theoretical stages into the real number of trays or alternatively the height of a number of packed beds. And we can do this either with tray efficiency data or using the height equivalent of a theoretical plate, the HETP, which is what you use for packing. Now, when you do this conversion, the best way of doing it above any other way is to use operational efficiency data for a comparable system. However, that may not be available, at which point you're going to have to rely more on things like either mass transfer correlations or things like mercury vapour stage efficiencies. The thing to never forget, and I'm going to reiterate this a number of times, is that packed columns are incredibly sensitive to liquid distribution and multiple beds are usually required to overcome distribution problems. And we'll see graphically why this is the case in a few slides time. So let's think about the pros and cons of each of the different types of column internal. Let's think about trays to start with. Trays are a very, 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 very long established technology. They're easy to install and it's very easy to inspect the pressure vessel as well. If you've got a trade column, you've got a tray, then you've got your column walls. You can see the column walls, job done. You've got good corrosion allowance typically in trays. They're usually two to three millimeter stain, uh, steel plate. And so if you're getting a little bit of corrosion, then there's plenty of material there to take that. In terms of pressure drop, you're looking at about six millibar pressure drop per tray. Trays are pretty tolerant of solids. They've got a good liquid capacity and liquid distribution doesn't really figure as a problem. If you talk to refining experts, they loved trade systems because trade systems are robust, they're reliable, they're industry tested, and they just get on and do the job for 40 years. However, 
Packed columns are also very well um, appreciated by different parts of the process industries. Now, packing is a lot easier to install than trays. But if you're going to inspect the interior of the pressure vessel, you need to remove the packing before you can get that because it effectively blocks access to it. Now, packing materials can range from metals to ceramics to polymers. And if we're talking metal packing systems, the metal's very, very thin. It's usually shim type material, about 0.2 millimeters or less. If we're talking about other materials, ceramics can break, plastics can melt or deform. And so the choice of material largely depends on the duty of the system. If you've got a corrosive application, not particularly high temperature, maybe ceramic or plastic materials. If you've got a non-corrosive application at high temperature, then metals. One of the key benefits of packed systems is low pressure drop. Typically, you're talking about two millibar per meter of packed height, and typically, a height equivalent of theoretical plate could be less than a meter, and so you're outperforming trade columns on pressure drop. And this becomes particularly important if you're dealing with systems where low pressure drop is essential. So if you think, for example, of flue gas scrubbers on power stations, where you might use a packed system to provide your vapor liquid contact, a packed system would be very much preferable because you're not, under any circumstances, going to recompress the uh, amount of gas flow that comes across in a power station flue. You want a system that can cope with the um, pressure that that's delivered at and preferably impose as little as pressure drop as possible onto it. Packing can block. The flow paths are often a lot smaller and so packed systems aren't very good for dirty systems. They're intolerant of solids. Pack systems can also usually deal with higher liquid and gas capacities as well. And, as I've said before, liquid distribution is critical to the good functioning of a packed system. So we're going to look at trade systems to start with, and we'll have a look at a few things around tray design and tray configuration. Then we'll have a look at packed systems and have a look at liquid distribution systems and how that's achieved. So if we think of trays, the simplest distillation tray is a sieve tray. The mental model you've got here is a circular piece of material with a cord cut along it with thousands of holes drilled in it, no more than that. So sieve trays are cheap, sieve trays typically won't go wrong, there's nothing to break on a sieve tray unless it falls to pieces through corrosion. They will only be good at high vapour rates because, as we'll see in a minute, on the tray is a reservoir of liquid held back by a weir. Somehow you need to prevent that liquid from weeping through the holes in the sieve tray and just draining into the column sump. If you've got high vapour flow rate coming up through those holes, that will prevent the liquid from what is known as weeping. So sieve trays, good, cheap, robust, but they do weep at low vapour flow rates. So if you're dealing with low vapour flow rates, you need to do something else. You need to prevent liquid from draining through those holes. And so there are many different designs of tray that allow you to do that, including things like valve trays or bubble cap trays. These are more expensive and they're slightly more complex and they can go wrong. If you have a vapour surge through a distillation column, you can quite easily blow the valves out of a valve tray and end up with a sieve tray with humongously sized holes in and with all your liquid just falling straight into the tray below. So they're more complex, they'll need better maintenance. If we think about how trays are configured, let's look at some simple pictures here on the whiteboard. So typically what you'll have is a tray and around the edge of that tray you're going to have a weir. The height of that weir determines the volume of liquid that is held onto that tray and hence if we think about a sieve tray the volume of liquid through which the gas is bubbling and so this will determine how close you get to vapour liquid equilibrium. When the liquid overflows that weir it goes down a channel called a downcomer and goes on to the tray below. And so what we want to avoid is that downcomer from becoming flooded and choking the column. So we need to think how many weirs we have, how many downcomers we have, dependent on our liquid flow rate. So there's some nice rules of thumb for you to think about. If your weir flow rate is greater than 18 litres per minute per centimetre depth of down cover, so if we're looking in plan view, that's where the centimetres would go, then increase your number of passes. So we can go from one pass to two pass, and here we have a system where we have a central down cover from one tray to two exterior down covers on the tray below, and that pattern will repeat. And again, 
if we apply our rule of thumb on our weir flow rate, if again we exceed 18 litres per minute per centimetre, then we'll go to four pass. And we can see there we've got a nice symmetric system in the both the two pass and the four pass system. And typically two pass systems, you're looking at over about a metre and a half diameter. Four pass systems, you're looking at about over about three metres diameter. Now, on Moodle, I've put some extra resources for you. I've given you uh, BP's guide to the selection of column internals and also an AICHE presentation on distillation trays. So these will give you some more background information to absorb around these systems. So let's think about how we might lay out a packed column. So in trade towers, typically the tray between spaces is about 600 millimetres. And so that will set your column height once you know the number of real trays you have in your system. Now, we also need to think about how we get to these trays. So if we've got a valve system, a valve tray system, and we've blown out valves, we don't want to have to climb the entire column to get to the damaged trays. So typically what you're going to do is provide external access every 10 to 15 trays or so. Where you have external access, you need a bit more room for people to get in. And so around an access point, you'll have a tray spacing of 750 mil rather than 600 mil. So we need to think about the size of the pipes coming into a distillation column. If you've got a liquid phase feed, for example, then you want to aim for greater, just less than or equal to about a meter per second of superficial velocity liquid. If you've got a two-phase flow, I've put a rule of thumb for you here that will give you, again, a means of specifying that pipe diameter. So that will allow you to set the pipe diameter in. And what we then need to do is think about the spacing of the trays at that feed stage. And so we've got a choice here. It's the largest of either five times the inlet diameter or 750 millimetres. So 750 millimetres is your minimum tray height, but it can be a lot higher depending on how big the inlet is. Now, we, are now, we need to allow space for vapour and liquid to segregate above the top tray. So, again, we have a choice here. It's the larger of either half the column diameter or 750 millimetres. So 750 mil is the smallest disengagement space going up to half the column diameter. If we think around the reboiler, you allow a metre's worth of height for your reboiler between your reboiler return and the bottom tray in your column. Now onto the sump. If we're in the bottom of the column, we have our liquid holdup. Remember that that liquid holdup can be controlled as a part of our mass balance scheme. And that amount of liquid holdup is important to allow downstream continuity of operation. So if your residue is being pumped away to somewhere else, then allow a surge capacity of five minutes worth of flow rate. If that is smaller than the holdup capacity of three minutes worth of flow rate, go for the larger of these two. Likewise, if you're feeding another distillation column, you need to allow a little bit more margin. So a surge capacity of 10 minutes or a hold up capacity of five minutes, whichever is the largest. And again, I've put more information in your design notes around sizing sumps. So let's think about packing. Packing comes in one of two different flavors. Random packing, which is basically a shape or a geometry that you tip into the top of the column onto a retaining plate that will uh, prevent it from falling into the sump, or structured packing, which looks like layered rivita one on top of another. Now there are many, 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 many different designs of both random packing and structured packing, and you'll find that the vendors of each of these systems will tell you that their system is by far the best to use. However, look at the data. The most important factors in determining a choice are going to be your height equivalent of a theoretical plate, your liquid distribution characteristics, and your pressure drop per meter of packed height. So if you've got a column that has a particularly large number of theoretical plates, try and get a small HETP. If you're dealing with systems where you can't afford to raise the pressure of the gas phase that's going through here, aim for low pressure drop per unit meter. Again, particularly good for scrubbing systems. Then think about what materials you're going to use and try and avoid corrosion problems. Now, that point again, packed columns. The bane of packed columns is liquid maldistribution. So whatever you do, you've got to design or allow for the, and allow for the placement of good liquid distribution systems. Let's show you some drawings of a liquid distribution system. So I'm gonna give you two views, a top view and a side view. Let me talk through what's going on here. 
If we examine the side view first, we can see that we're putting liquid into our column. This might be, for example, where the reflux return comes in. What we're doing is we're putting that liquid through a long horizontal pipe. A long horizontal pipe has got a series of holes drilled into it, and each of those holes drains into a trough that goes at right angles to the screen. And of course, we can see those things that go right angle to the screen in the top view. So in the top view, the vertical blue strips are each of these troughs that are fed by the, the perforated feed tube. And we can see that in each of these troughs, you've got a number of holes drilled, which allows liquid to spray out. And what we're trying to achieve here is a uniform spray of liquid all over the packed bed. And the dashed circle is, if you like, the perimeter of that packed bed. So it's an incredibly glorified shower head. What you're trying to do is spray liquid as evenly as possible on top of the packing. Because if you think about the picture of the structured packing where you've got shapes that zigzag in and out, after a long enough height, what's going to happen is that the liquid may well just migrate to the outer edge of the column. If, for example, your distributor has been set at anything other than flat, all the liquid will run to one side and you'll get liquid just running down one side of your column. Again, this is not going to be very good for your column operation. So it's absolutely imperative that distribution systems are flat and level, that the distribution is even and equal in order for your packed column to operate efficiently. Now, what we'll see in a minute is that there is a maximum recommended depth of packing to avoid liquid maldistribution. So if you've got a particularly tall column with lots of theoretical stages, you're going to need to collect up the liquid and then redistribute it onto a new packed bed. And so our distribution system starts to look a little different from that of, say, a reflux return, and may look like this. So let me talk you through this new side view. At the top of this picture, what you have is a packed bed above the one of interest. We have liquid flowing down, we have gas flowing up. At the base of this packed bed, we have effectively a big chimney tray, where chimney tray allows vapour to pass up unhindered, but collects liquid. That liquid is then collected in the pools I've illustrated and feeds into the distribution system that we've just talked about. So what we have here is a collection system followed by a distribution system. And it's not uncommon to have several of these throughout a tall packed column. And of course, the key ramification here is that these take up space. So let's go through some rules of thumb for packed column layout. What we want to do to avoid mal liquid maldistribution is to assume a maximum packed bed depth of six metres. Try not to get to six metres. If your packed bed needs to be seven metres, break it down into two, three and a half metre beds. It's more reliable to do that than to try and get a big bed and then a small bed. Between each packed bed, you need a collector and a distributor. And you're going to have about a 1.2 metre spacing between the packed beds to allow that to actually fit in. If you've got particularly large diameter columns, then the space required for collectors and distributors can be as up to high as two to three metres. When referring to vapour disengagement zones, use the same rules of thumb as for trade columns, also for inlets and for feed spacings and so on. Make sure you've got access to each of the collector and distributor problems. You can't get access into your packing. It's, it's solid. You're not going to get someone crawling into that. But what you can do is put access points at your collection and distribution systems, so every six metres or so. Let's recap a few key points. So trade columns tend to be more robust than packed columns, but packed columns are very good for clean duties that require low pressure drops and high throughputs. When designing a trade column, be sure to select the appropriate type of tray. So remember that sieve trays are basically steel plates with holes in, very good for high vapour flow rates, very bad for low vapour flow rates because all the liquid just drains straight through the holes. Ensure also that you've got the correct number of tray passes such that you're not choking your columns by flooding your downcomers. Packing can either be random or structured, and many different types of both random and structured packing are available, and many, many materials are in common use. And finally, that key point again, be very aware of the importance of good liquid distribution in packed columns.